Uh, this last half of the workshop, we're going to talk about making a difference, how we make a change. We're going to talk about how we do that in music therapy, but how we do that in the larger world. Uh, as therapists, there is no not great benefit to helping women survive violence if they're going to go back uh, out into a, a violent world, into an abusive relationship or, or whatever. So we really need to talk about a, a larger socio-cultural change uh, and not thinking of it as individual women's problems and individual men's problems. Feminism was a grassroots movement. Feminist therapy was a grassroots movement. Feminist music therapy was a grassroots movement. So feminist therapy came out in the 70s when social workers and psychologists realized that their professions were grossly sexist, uh, including sexual abuse of clients by, by therapists, but also the more subtle things that we've talked about, of issues of power and that kind of thing. And they were finding that therapy wasn't helpful. And then finally, we're a little late to the party in music therapy, but around the 1990s, uh, music therapists started reading writings by social workers and psychologists saying, you know, we need to be better informed about how our culture impacts everybody's lives uh, and so how we can do a better job. Uh, so uh, it, I can only talk, I can talk in big terms about broad strokes about feminist music therapy, but because it's a grassroots movement, it's very individual. Even on understanding what feminism is, there's really many definitions of feminism. So I will talk to you about my approach to uh, feminism, and hopefully if you are interested, you will go ahead and make your own approach to feminist music therapy. So my approach is intersectional, and I think that's maybe the plus side of music therapists being so late to the party, is that they got to see all the past history of how badly feminism got in uh, looking at only white basically middle-class women's experiences and not looking at diverse women. So I, I hope we have a better start at it, but it's probably always a challenge. So I look at not at only how gender impacts our clients' lives and our men and women clients and therapists' lives, um, uh, and, but also how all the other social locations uh, impact their lives. So, but I thought I'd start with this other Saturday Night Live uh, clip. About feminism. We put pen to paper and wrote all through the night A gorgeous ode to feminism well within our sights But this is pretty nuanced stuff And putting it all in one song was tough And that's why this is not a feminist song We tried real hard but it took too long This is not a feminist song Cause we were scared <laughs> and every struggle's real, but just try and write a song that captures every woman's deal. So instead of writing lyrics, here's us running in the sand. There's a bunch of lens flares and an old woman's hand. To call a woman old or judge a woman's hands. No, I won't, but should it be reduced to just her hands? <laughs>
mind <laughs> as we move towards spreading our own. And also the issues of uh, the challenges for feminists of uh, how do we include everybody and not exclude others. And yet it's so hard because we look at the world from our own frame, our own lens, and then it gets very challenging. So even though we have an advantage as a uh, music therapist being late to the party and knowing we should be inclusive, it's still always going to be a challenge. So we always have to be keeping thinking about that, uh, both uh, as individual people, but also as therapists working with our clients. Um, so let's have a look then at sort of general terms about what music ther feminist music therapy means and a little bit about how it's practiced. So there's really, th really simple but profoundly difficult and deep thoughts about feminist music therapy. So the first is the personal is political. And that's so that, and it's, I've, I did a survey of music therapists in Canada and the US, and a couple of them said, well, I'm in, I'm in therapy, it's not political. Everything we do in our lives is political because the sociocultural influences our lives. And similarly, our clients' lives. So even if we're women music therapists working with women clients, we're still impacted by what our culture says, or if we're women working with women from different backgrounds, or we're women working with men. So we have to have an understanding uh, that our clients' lives and our lives are influenced by the world around us. Uh, by pretending it doesn't exist doesn't mean it won't exist, it just means we're ignorant of it. So you can't uh, help a woman uh, learn to love herself and stand up for her rights and then not understand if she's going back into a relationship with an abuser, what that's going to mean. And when the, she calls the cops or doesn't call the cops, uh, doesn't call because she's afraid her husband will be uh, racially profiled and maybe go to jail and then where will she be? Or doesn't call because she knows they'll throw him in jail for a night and he'll come back even angrier. So we have to be aware of all that happens in our lives and in our clients' lives. The second is that in, uh, relationships are to be egalitarian. Uh, traditional therapy was not egalitarian. It was the therapist as expert and the client as ignorant person in need of <laughs> treatment. Uh, we've come a long way in, in how we look at therapy now, but not all uh, therapies do emphasize an egalitarian relationship, but feminist music therapy says it's essential that to aim for. Our clients come to us because they have needs and they're struggling. And so automatically there's an imbalance of power. So it's our responsibility as therapists to help them right that balance. But it's not just in our relationships with our clients, it's in their relationships with the other people in their lives. One of the biggest indicators of an abusive relationship is an egal inegalitarian balance of power in the relationship. So it doesn't matter where, what walks of life, what, where you're from, what class, socioeconomic class, if there's an in imbalance of power, then you have a greater risk of being in an abusive relationship. But it's also in the therapist's own life, again, so we look at power. And then the final thing is that women's value perspectives are to be valued. And we think, well, duh. But we looked at that. That's not, that's not normalized in our culture yet. Uh, so women aren't believed when they report being uh, victims of violence. Um, so we, and it's not just, you know, now people say, well, we'll never, we have to believe everyone. Then people are going to be readily accused of, of misdoings. But what happens is we give the accused innocent until proven guilty, but we do not give the accuser believed, in, uh, believed enough to look into it. We assume, the culture assumes guilty that they're, they're lying, that they, they're reporting falsely, or they got confused. <laughs> but so so uh, working towards helping them understand, uh, your clients and the therapist understand that. So there's a few goals, uh, and, they're, and they're fairly straightforward, but really important uh, in feminist music therapy, and they come out of those principles. So an under, helping with the client to understand the socio-political uh, implications, what that means in their lives, um, that it's not just them, that they chose a bad guy or they, they dressed wrong, because we looked at internalization, and our women's first response to sexual assault is shame. 
and they are shamed by the abuser and then by the, the response of those around them. Uh, men's first response to hearing that their partner was sexually assaulted by somebody else is anger. And so we have people coming from different backgrounds and they, how do they connect together? They have trouble understanding that a woman feels shame even though she shouldn't. So uh, increasing the socio-political understanding. Uh, the second is to empower those who are mar marginalized. And that means empowered in their personal life, but that's not enough. They have to be empowered in, in the true meaning of the word, political, uh, economical. Uh, so that's our jobs as, as well, to be working towards that. And helping them recover from the harm of the abuse. So they're not, uh, they're not responsible for personally changing who they are because they asked for it, but by virtue of being a, a victim of male violence, they have, are survivors of incredible harm and may need some help in getting over that. And then the final most important one, it's not in, in many music therapy approaches, is the need to make actual change, societal change. Uh, that's a responsibility. Uh, you see community music therapy looks at music therapy going from the therapy room to the community, but it's uh, not a requirement or an obligation to change the community in which they, some do, some don't. In feminist music therapy, you have a moral imperative to work towards changing it. Okay, and then after that we'll, uh, we'll look at these very briefly and then we'll look at them in practice as well. So the techniques are not any different than what music therapy techniques are. They're just used for different goals. So the technique of uh, listening to music and lyric analysis, and we've done some of that today uh, in, in, in this workshop. Uh, so using that, but just like anybody else, but for the different purpose, for doing a feminist analysis of power, and the socio-political underpinnings that go on in women's lives and men's lives. The second one is songwriting. We haven't done that yet, but we will by the end of this project. Uh, the therapist's role in doing that, again, is to help them give voice to their experiences. We touched on it, Jen, we didn't talk too much specifically, but one of the uh, underpinnings is uh, violence against women is the silencing of the powerful silencing. We certainly saw that most recently with the Kavanaugh hearings and, and whatnot. But we see how women are silenced, they're not believed. You saw that in Lady Gaga's Till It Happens to You. So to give women through songwriting their own voice. And um, then uh, it also allows them to be empowered as well. And then we do a little music-centered relaxation because women, particularly women in abusive relationships, um, they don't typically leave until um, their children are at risk. They say, well, I can take it, I'm a grown, grown up, I'm responsible, but I'll, I, I, the minute it happens to my children. But they've got to understand that's part of the devaluing of women, that they deserve better, they didn't ask for it, and just because they're not children doesn't mean they're not innocent victims. Uh, and so part of that, then, the music-centered relaxation has helped them to take care of themselves. Uh, and to know that that's important uh, for themselves and also for their children. You can't take care of your children if your children are in an environment where they're seeing their fathers beat their mothers. And then the final thing, technique, is social activism. The first technique at looking at music, listening, and analysis. Uh, we've looked at some songs about violence and those kinds of things, but in looking in mu feminist music therapy, we're looking at the whole array of experiences. Everything, all of the underpinnings, but what empowers women, what disempowers women. So it doesn't have to be just about violence. Uh, and so we're going to give you just a little glimpse of uh, some songwriter uh, who is challenging the ideas of beauty. Uh, and because we've talked about it, Beauty is involved in devaluing women, in objectifying women, and again, uh, if we don't feel, if we spend so much time thinking about how bad we look compared to what we'd like to look, my gosh, it's very hard to live a life when your focus is on I'm not good enough to meet that standard that I'm there. So let's have a quick look at part of the song. <laughs> Chug of the day is just heating up. So what? These boy shorts are hitching up.
uh, a challenge. We don't usually see such a diversity of body styles, body types uh, in our culture. Uh, how many of you have ever been on a diet? <laughs> oh, okay, we're doing pretty good. <laughs> uh, apparently the number of women uh, on diets in a, on a given day is astonishing. And actually, there are more women who think worse of their bodies than their bodies are. And there are more men who think better of their bodies than their bodies merit. We could learn a little from them. <laughs> so in any case, just to think about when we're looking at uh, analysis, so there are you know, songs of all sorts of different things, and you'll bring those in. When I do the uh, feminist analysis uh, and songs, I always use women singer-songwriters. Uh, and that's not because I don't like men singer-songwriters and that they have great things to say. But when I'm working with women clients, um, so many have a, have a view of an imbalanced world view of men in power and women not, that for them to be able to see themselves in women in song is easier to see themselves in women's song. And what a wonderful time of history to be using women's songs. There's so much out there that's so fabulous. Uh, so there's no reason you can't use men's songs. And occasionally, I, I think I did, I did uh, use Eminem's uh, Bonnie and Clyde uh, song, uh, which is uh, a song about a singer singing about he's just murdered his wife and he's throwing her body in the trunk of a car. Uh, but I use that to sort of challenge our ideas of what's normal. So sometimes it can be used to effect, but it's typically very helpful to use women singer-songwriters in music therapy. Second technique is, is uh, songwriting. Uh, and uh, this can be from using, working with women in a very structured to a much more simple, a much more complex, um, original kind of style. You all have your techniques in learning about music therapy, how to do songwriting, how to support it. It has to be particularly, with survivors of violence, it has to be well supported because they're feeling rather fragile and not confident in themselves. And when you come in as a, a therapist who's got a higher education, uh, they may be seeing you as coming in with a red pen grading their ability to write and that's not how it should be so you have to give them that support and I use a lot of different songs that uh, have very simple lyrics like Tracy Chapman's Behind the Wall uh, uses everyday language not poetic kinds of things so they can begin to see that you, as you are is what makes a good songwriter your own experience. I'd like to show you one little example of somebody who did one uh, using her own, her own songwriting uh, about the most recent news events. It's scary time for boys, yeah, gentlemen, men together make some noise. It's really tough when your reputation's on the line and any woman you insult and could turn off any time. So you're going to get some experience songwriting for yourselves uh, to give voice to your experience. Uh, but that will give you an, maybe a, some ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes when you start working with your clients uh, writing songs. Um, in any case, the next technique uh, is uh, social activism. That's a critical part. It's very personal how what you choose is your uh, area uh, as a music therapist but and it's easy not to do that it's well it's no it's my personal life but we know the personal is political so as a as a music therapist you have an obligation uh, to work towards change 
Um, one of my clients uh, decided to choose the song. She, we were doing a take back the night. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. So it's a pro, it's a, a march that uh, originated, I think, in Germany, where uh, there was a large number of rapes going on at the time, and the police department thought the best solution would be to put a curfew on women, uh, not being out after 9 p.m. Once again having women take responsibility for stopping the rape rather than maybe they should have put a curfew on men. <laughs> so uh, I was working on that with this, uh, this uh, in the local community I was working with. And so one woman decided she would choose, she brought in a song that she wanted to be, uh, the song to be at the Take Back the Night. So it was part of a social community activism thing. Another one of my women clients um, actually came to me after we'd recorded her song and she said, could I have an extra copy? And that was in the day of CDs. I said, sure, no problem. And I thought, hmm, she sort of ran out without explaining. Uh, she came back the next uh, week and said, and this was a woman who had survived uh, childhood sexual abuse at the hand of her uncle. And her uncle had said, uh, I didn't do it. And half the family believed her uncle and half the family believed her. Uh, so it, she was, it was 30 years later and she was still struggling with it. So she came back to me the next week and she said, I gave the copy of my song to my uncle. And I said to him, I know what you did. You know what you did. And now the world knows what you did. And she said, I don't care what you do now. I'm moving on with my life. So it was a really incredibly powerful moment for her to really have her voice and to heck with the rest of the family who didn't believe her. So, powerful. I am light. I am light. I am not the color of my eyes. I am not the skin. Nice that she was doing it alone too with the guitar, mm -hmm. no band or anything. Yeah. I thought it kind of made it more powerful mm -hmm. that it was just her. Mm -hmm. All right, how did you like that song? Great. The reason I chose it, the reason I chose that song was again to think about the diversity of music that you can bring to your clients. So not just looking at violence uh, and the, the socio-political underpinnings of violence, but also empowerment, how we can find and learn self-acceptance. So often important for women who are survivors of male violence because the message is you asked for it. Um, the message from the abuser, the message from the people around them often. Uh, if it's not your fault for being abused, it's your fault for not leaving or not leaving soon enough. So how do we, and, and from the shame that women internalize themselves, no matter what people around them say. So learning self-acceptance, uh, and forgiveness and loving ourselves no matter what the challenge is, is an important part of it. Uh, the women I worked with, one of the women said five years after the abuse, the hardest thing for her to still achieve that she was still struggling with was her self-esteem. Uh, she, you know, the bruises were gone, the broken bones, and she had really catastrophic injuries, but she said the self-esteem was the hardest. And that's hard uh, for ourselves as therapists who also grew up as women in a culture that's misogynistic. Uh, and sometimes we may be self-deprecating and that kind of thing. Uh, so the journey is for ourselves as well for, as for our clients. So um, India Ari said she was singing a song for us. Before we go uh, and break, I want to sing it with us, with you. Uh, so the lyrics are in the last of your song sheet. Can you read it? We're just going to sing the chorus. We're just going to sing the chorus and uh, the last verse. Mm. I don't remember it. Oops, I need to get comfortable. Mm. And as you catch on to it, sing along, we'll sing the, the chorus a couple of times, and feel free to join in, and feel free to join in harmony if you'd like. I am light, 